Hello and welcome to part one of four of the Crown Colony class Long Troll. Now, for those of you who are eagle-eyed, you might have noticed that the camera angle has slightly changed. The great advantage of building it yourself is eventually, you can admit, it worked well when I was sitting back there, but now I'm sitting farther forward, I'm constantly looking up at the camera, and therefore I, I don't look like I'm looking you in the eye. And I like to look like I'm looking my glasses in the eye, and I like to look like I, I think I better if I look like I'm looking you in the eye now, or at least looking approximately to your eyes, you know. So, yeah. Camera has now changed. Which is good. And at a certain point, I wouldn't be surprised if the old pal I used to have, which would uh, keep me company, reappears down here to provide something for me to talk to. So, the Crown Colony class, as this was alive on the 4th of March, that is what we're going to, uh, that is the date up there, but of course today is will be the 9th of March. Cool. This is in the future, or the past, depending on perspective. Right then. Without much further ado, let's get into the Crown Colony class. And here's the background. So, in 1936, this is what's going on in the world. King George V dies. The fourth Winter Olympics is held in Germany. Germany reoccupies the Rhineland. Spanish Civil War erupts. The 11th Summer Olympics are held in Germany. There's the Edward VIII abdication crisis. Yes, there's that gentleman off to the uh, right uh, to the right of your screen, which I'm going to use it to break further away from England, Britain, which does have an impact on World War II, believe it or not. Then there's the Far East. There's the February 26th incident in Japan, uh, which only ends when Emperor Hirohito pretty much threatens to execute his army high command. The anti comintern pact is signed between Japan and in Japan. The Zian incident, Zheng Chiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China is kidnapped by Marshal Zhang Ziling. And the West China famine leaves an estimated 5 million dead. And in the rest of the world, well, Italy's off found an exciting Asian trip, having finally taken over Ethiopia and forms the Italian East Africa with their other colonies. And Joseph Stalin begins his great purge. Now, here is the thing. It's actually the Staga of Ethiopia which introduces to much of our modern lexicon the idea of the Italian army being absolutely atrocious. Because despite the British army having been managed to be, be defeated by um, Zulus at Islandwana, and uh, having a fair other joyous things in Afghanistan and various other places, um, the Italian army uh, had managed to somehow rather successfully. Kind of like Austria has managed to persuade the world that Hitler was German. <laughs> um, it had managed to skip, the, wrong, the British army has managed to skip past them and still be a famed army with its fighting prowess, etc. Possibly it's because of Il Duce and the way he dresses up the conquest of Ethiopia and the fact that he pretends it's going to be so easy, and they've got air power and machine guns, and they are sending everything at it, and it's in the modern media age, and they get their... Oh, they do eventually win. Of course they win. There is no chance they're not going to win eventually. But, um, yeah. It's really not fun for the Italians. And let's work back, let's look at the Far East, what's going on there? Well, we've got the anti comintern Pact, which is an anti-communist pact, that sounds lovely. Can't think why Russia found that mildly disturbing. Uh, the Xi'an incident, uh, Chiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China is kidnapped by Marshal Xiang Huling. Zhang Huling. We forget that China has got an ongoing civil war, which in many ways is only abated when the Japanese turn up. So you have basically have a civil war going on, and the Sino-Japanese the, the Sino wars happen as well. 
China is one of those countries which doesn't react well well to the world changing around it in the 1900s, in the 18, late 1800s. Um, Japan is often held up as a nation which did react well. I wouldn't get, agree they reacted well either. I would say the Japanese uh, put... How do I put this politely? The Japanese focus on development of industry and military and don't go through possibly the necessary cultural but more importantly political development they need to and when i say that you need to if you're going to harness those powers as fully and as effectively as you can you need to start being able to delegate authority lower and lower and if you cannot delegate authority lower and lower for either cultural or political or whatever reason you have you have a problem which tends to uh, turn into what i would say the structural issues which japan is fighting with in world war ii because And I give as a classic example of this, uh, you have the famous example of Midway and of, yes, there is differing evidence about how it's reacted, where in one exercise, uh, one of the pre-exercises, they lose. And they lose because, well, the officers, the young junior officers, throw in something into the game into the game which is likely but has been ruled as unlikely by the umpires uh, because it kind of spoils their game that is a shame it spoils their game So, you are left with a scenario in China where they have tried to develop, but in many ways, I would argue they focused on the wrong service. They focused on their army and focused inwards domestically. When in many ways, the Chinese needed to have a navy. They have a humongous coastline, and the only way they could stop foreign powers, local, regional, or international, and all three like to turn up, preying on them was to actually start exercising control of the sea around them, and exercise some sort of level of control. But that would also require a lot more structural investment and a lot more stability. And that's the one thing Japan has as an advantage. It does have some forms of stability. And I would argue the February 26th incident of 1936 is a good example of why Japan has some form of stability. Because as much as the factions might want to fight for control of the emperor, or might think they're acting in the emperor's best wishes. At a certain point, as long as the emperor is halfway competent, <coughs> there is a kind of limiting factor. And in this case, Hirohito stops it. Basically threatens to broadcast on the radio that he since doesn't support the coup, that he really doesn't want like what's going on. In which case, a lot of very senior generals who have been tacitly allowing what's been happening to go on to go on could well find themselves on the receiving end of their own soldiers. So immediately they decide to start their own soldiers up and dealing with it. So a junior officer's operation, it's always marketed as a junior officer because again, 
in Japan, junior officers are well known for acting on their own initiative without any senior officer telling them what to do. They're a part of the operation which is actually quite well planned and have all a significant amount of information. After Hirohito makes his feelings shown to the senior officers, amazingly the operation starts to break down rapidly as if the support and possibly even the command structure of that operation has suddenly decided it's not involved anymore. But let's blame it on junior officers. And then we have Europe. We have Europe. Why do I bother having Edward VIII here? Why is his crisis so interesting? Okay, there is his well-known sympathies with various dictators and his um, level of arrogance and stupidity. But, leaving that all to one side, there is the fact that Britain at this point is not really looking outside in terms of its political classes. In 1936, its political class, more than ever, are very focused on inward, on working out. What is the result going to be? Is Britain going to become a republic? Believe it or not, there have been people agitating for Britain to become a republic for a long time. I believe there were a fair number of them around the time, during the time of Oliver Cromwell, in fact. Quite a large number of them. And the trouble is... As the argument usually goes, yes, it would be nice to have a republic, but we've met our own politicians. People who go, no, 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 it's it'll be fine. I go, well, which political side are you from? You're from one side. Would you like a President Blair? Oh, most successful left-wing politician um, in Britain's electoral history. Won more elections than anyone on the left. On the left. Like a President Johnson, if you're from the other side of the political side, they're going, oh, no, 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 that wouldn't happen. I went, well, how are you going to elect the president? Let's be honest, if you're doing it, uh, if you're doing it, you basically are going to have a runoff, have a mass election, probably, let's say, a French system. No, many people, then the two most popular go forward. Two most popular are probably going to be the leader, uh, the leaders, or the, the candidates of the major left wing and the major right wing parties, centre ones, hopefully. <clears throat> then people are left with a binary solution and a binary option. It's either one or the other. So. That's the issues going up. It's fun. If you think about it in the 1930s, what were the options? Chamberlain, Baldwin, Churchill. Think who might have been elected. Think who might have been prime minister or president in a republic. Or there's always the other option you go, no, 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 we won't have president. We'll just give all the power to parliament, which means in effect you're going to give all the power to the prime minister because the British system is quite simple. The prime minister is the leader of the largest party in parliament, and it's a majority vote system. Oh, we're going to change that. Ah, yes, okay. So you're going to have to have an even bigger constitutional change because you're going to change the legislature. You're going to change the electra, uh, the ele probably the electoral method of the legislature. You're going to change this. Believe it or not, was part of the crisis in the 1930s. 
because as with many things in politics and as with many realities in international relations the headline has very little bearing to the content headline become a republic next content is how on um, by the way you have to make sure every the vast majority of people are happy with this the whole way up and if they aren't happy with those options they're probably going to say why change the system or quite happy with how it is because it means we've got a system we don't like but we haven't got a system we don't like even more yeah default again and before anyone comments and is going no no people would like to change and they like to change i have mentioned in the past that i worked as an it technician or at, while i was going through my bachelor's in his doing my ba that's how i worked and that's how i paid for my living expenses and managed to support myself it was being an IT technician. You do not want to know how many people's passwords were one, two, three, four, five, six, or QWERTY, or some other variation, or even password one. I. People like the easy option, and default is the easy option. Why? Because not because people are bad, but because we have enough going on in our lives which are complicated. It's the same with international relations. In 1936, Britain has internal issues. That means the people watching externally or getting involved and pushing on when it comes to defense matters or security matters are the people who really care about that in the party which runs the government not necessarily the wider majority and the context are the people who might go hang on what about the context yes that's a great idea we love the idea but what about the subtext there is also the Spanish Civil War going on, and for some reason that absorbs a lot of French attention. I can't think why. It's not as if they share a border with it, and they share a border with Germany and the border of Italy, and are now thinking, hang on, we can end up with a fascist, uh, a fascist state on three of our borders. And he now suddenly has great sympathy with the concept of a piñata. Now, of course, we all know from World War Two that... Franco doesn't get involved in World War II other than intelligence-wise and being very be beneficent to the um, Axis powers. But, but, it's still a worry. So that's what's going on in the world politically at this time. Oh, and we've also got Germany making all the big fuss over the Olympics. It's always great when, when dictatorships get to make a big fuss over Olympics and go, look at how brilliant they did. We've dressed all these people up in nappies so they won't have to go away and pee. Oh, no, that wasn't, that wasn't Germany. That was China. Um, right, town class. This is what the Royal Navy really wants. These are their honestly not surface raiders gov honestly they're just very large cruisers which have lots of six inch guns and a lot of fuel and a lot of range they are aimed to be roughly ten thousand tons they're all roughly over it they aim to carry a lot of aircraft they all do and they carry 12 six-inch guns, but we all know the Royal Navy would really love the version which would carry 16 six-inch guns. Uh, it's like if the Royal Navy had cracked the formula for the auto-loading eight-inch gun 
which got the 70 degrees and could be fitted in a treble turret, which at one point they do seem to be looking into in the 1920s. Probably the six inch town class, like we know, wouldn't have existed. The Royal Navy would have just kept trying to say, say, we want to churn out eight inch cruisers. But that wasn't the case. It's like also if they cracked the, uh, they cracked the autoloader pre World War II of the six inch gun. <sighs> Imagine these destroy uh, these ships. Imagine the destruction they could have wrought. Right now. So with all those politics going on, someone thought, let's have a great idea. Let's have a disarmament con conference and all cut our weapons. Because we have great faith in all these dictatorships and very, very stable countries that they are gonna do what they sign up to. Because it's not going to be a different government in a week or two weeks' time in that country that signs it. No. And as anyone who knows British defence policy, a new defence secretary can change an entire and the Ministry of Defence procurement orders because they have different desires or different directions for other orders from their government or from their prime minister. A new prime minister can change the whole defence. A new party? It's a completely different ball game. It, it's just... Th that, and that's a democracy, which has fairly regular elections, so you can be sort of predicting when the change is going on. It's not a scenario where, ah, we got assassinated again. Who's going to be formed the government this time? Do you have good bodyguards? Do you trust them? Are they armed with machine guns? You know, th th those sort of things. <sighs> that doesn't affect a country's reliability to uh, actually, inf actually enforce and work with treaties, does it? So, the 1936 London Naval Treaty. Article 1. For the purposes of the present treaty, the following expressions are to be understood in the sense hereafter defined. A. Standard displacement. The standard displacement of a surface vessel is the displacement of the vessel complete, fully ready for sea, including all armament and ammunition, equipment, outfit, provisions, and fresh water for crew, miscellaneous stores, and implements of every description that are intended to be carried in the war without fuel or reserve feed water on board. This is, of course, where uh, this is, of course, the validation of water as army, as armor for um, the Royal Navy, but you've got fuel, you've got reserve feed water. In other words, the range of your ships doesn't count to their displacement, which is great if you want to build long range ships. Or if you want to carry a lot of extra feed water, which you probably won't actually need, but which does have an effect on things trying to get into and blow up. And next one. The standard displacement of a submarine is the surface displacement of the vessel, complete, exclusive of the water in not watertight structure. Fully manned, engined, and equipped, ready for sea, including all armament and ammunition, equipment, outfit, provisions for crew, miscellaneous stores, and implements of every description that are intended to be carried in war, but without fuel, lubricating oil, fresh water, or ballast water of any kind on board. That's even better for a submarine. Fresh water doesn't count, ballast water doesn't count, lubricating oil doesn't count, and fuel doesn't count. I expect the surface ships are sitting there going, there is so much we could be using for this. The word ton, except an expression, metric tons, denotes a ton of 2,240 pounds, or 1,016 kilos. Categories. And yes, I have skipped a bit down here because I've skipped one and two because frankly, they don't matter to anyone in this discussion. Three, light surface battles are surface vessels of war other than aircraft carriers, battleships, that's not included, capital ships, uh, minor war vessels, or auxiliary vessels to the standard displacement of which exceeds 100 tons, does not exceed 10,000 tons, and which do not carry a gun with a caliber exceeding 8 inches or 203 millimeters. The category of light service vessels is divided into three subcategories as follows. Vessels which carry a gun with a calibre exceeding 6.1 inches. 
Bezels which do not carry a gun within a calibre exceeding 6.1 inches and the standard displacement of which exceeds 3,000 tonnes. Vessels which do not carry a gun with a calibre exceeding 6,001 inch gun, a standard displacement of which does not exceed 3,000 uh, tonnes. Article 6. Again, I've skipped a bit. One, no light vessel of subcategory B exceeding 8,000 tons standard displacement and no light service vessel of subcategory A shall be laid down or acquired prior to the 1st of January 1943. I.e., we are going to say that for the next seven years, you can't build your big cruisers. That's nice to everyone. That makes the Royal Navy very happy. Notwithstanding the provisions of paragraph one above, if the requirements of the national security of any high contracting party are, in his opinion, materially unaffected by the actual or authorized amount of construction by any power of light surface vessels of subcategory B or of light surface vessels not conforming to the restrictions of paragraph one above, such high contracting party shall, upon notifying the other high contracting parties of his intentions and the reasons, therefore, have the right to lay down and require light surface vessels or subcategories A. B and B of any standard displacement up to 10,000 tons, subject to the observance of the provisions of part three of the present treaty. Each of the other high contracting parties shall thereupon be entitled to exercise the same right. Three, it is understood that the provisions of paragraph one above constitute no undertaking expressed or implied to continue the restrictions therein prescribed after the year 1942. Now, here is the interesting thing. I find this treaty amazing in many, many ways. I find the fact that it was actually agreed to in 1936 absolutely absurd. Uh, it's a last gasp effort, you can say, at trying to maintain peace. But honestly, is that going to work? How is peace going to be maintained? How? Who are you maintaining peace with? You've got... The Spanish Civil War going on, where things are blowing up rapidly around you. You have got fascist dictatorships on the rise, one of whom is going on a conquest spree in Africa. The other one is rapidly repudiating the Treaty of Versailles, which was supposed to ensure peace in our time after the Great War, but let's be honest. The Treaty of Versailles was more about squeezing the German pip, uh, orange till the pip squeaked. Um, and don't get me started on the Americans' clauses and various things attached to the loans they tried to. They get, they gave various powers in World War One. It's amazing how different the loans were given to Britain as were given to Germ uh, given to France and. Various other people. It's a really interesting scenario if you're Neville Chamberlain on uh, Neville Chamberlain in nineteen thirty-eight. But what's more important here? Okay. They are deciding that they are going to arbitrarily reduce ships by two thousand tons to limit and they're not gonna build the ten thousand ton cruisers. Now you can argue this is useful for the Royal Navy because they want to maximize cruiser tonnage as it is. But, and this is the point, if you consider the Royal, the Royal Navy, the British Army, the Royal Air Force, everyone is pretty much predicting that there is going to be a war in the beginning to mid 1940s. Which is not something they're predicting lightly. They are... don't want a war. <laughs> None of them want a war. They don't want to fight a war. Why? Because... Here's the dirty little secret. You can't predict or control when a, a wars. Once they start, you have no power over them. Neither side does because it's action, reaction, and contraction. Mm. There is 
no real control. People go, ah, oh, but we can do air campaigns. Really? And we can predict them out completely because we will now use precision guided weapons. Let's see, honest. The uh, you, we bombed up out of Kosovo, and when the Serbs withdrew, they actually had more equipment than we predicted. Uh, they actually withdrew with more equipment than we predicted they had at the beginning of the campaign, and it's found that we'd mostly blown up empty buildings and decoys. And why was that? Well, because the first time we'd launched air campaigns against Serbian forces in Bosnia, well, honestly, we were as honest. Bosnia is one of those conflicts which, frankly, any time you start reading up on it, you get the idea that there really aren't many nice sides in this. Once it gets fighting, it is a full. It is a proper civil war, and that's nothing. Civil wars are always like that. Anyone who tries to pretend to you that in a civil war there is one side which is sainted and lovely and all the other sides are evil is lying to themselves. It's very rare the moment it starts fighting in a civil war that there aren't going to be iffy bits on all sides. This doesn't say that they, they're all sides are equally bad. And this is not in any way excusing anything that gets happens in them. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't happen like that. It's just the lesson of history is civil wars are the nastiest of all wars. They always are. So, with that being said, you have to then think about what is this treaty for? What is this treaty going to provide Britain? What does this treaty provide America? Ah. There again, it's frustrated. Japan? They don't care. They don't care. They don't listen to any of the treaties previously anyway. Um, honestly, the Royal Navy tends to try and figure out a workaround, but that's a far harder workaround. They got two types of the cruiser, which are honestly 10,000 tons, Gov. Counties and the towns, well, the type A counties, and the type B counties aren't far off. Um, honestly, ten thousand tons. No, we do not have. We just. It's it it, it it it. You you're telling us that when war starts, we rapidly add armor and various other things onto these ships. Well, you know, that's that's wartime expediency. Where do we get all the armor from and how quickly when considering the state of the armor industry? Um, and we had the plans already worked out, so it didn't take that long to do. And, um, and the, 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 the pieces fit in just right and there's hardly any work need to be done on the hulls or anything to get them in. Um, And that's Britain, which has a very active press, even in the 1920s, 1930s, which would love to, there are sections of press which would love to reveal that. Um, and they're honestly basing on the idea that the, are they basing on the other sides are going to keep that part of the side of the agreement? Or do they think that the line is going to be with an acceptable level of 8,000 tons? That's what you have to start asking yourself. Or... Is there a significant disconnect between the politicians agreeing this and the reality? Because remember, the politicians' view, quite a lot of them involved in getting the 1936 on the treaty, naval treaty, for, is that the 1935 and previous attempts to get a new treaty, the London Treaty through, had failed because of the involvement of the naval personnel. The reason it had failed is the naval personnel had asked tricky questions like how do we enforce this is this practical can we really do this
It's almost so complicated. Anyway. So this leads to a lovely debate in Parliament, as you can imagine. <clears throat> Mr. Churchill, having fun here. Mr. Churchill asked Prime Minister whether his statement on 11th of March 1935 upon the subject of the escalator clause as applied to British cruiser coverage still holds good. Now, this was asked on the 13th of May 1936. The Prime Minister? The statement referred to by the right on general was part of a speech on the general question of defence and was not intended to be an exhaustive or final declaration on our position in regard to London Naval Treaty limits. In particular, the use of the words light cruisers may have caused some misapprehension. The preference was to a type of vessel which are classified by the French as destroyer leaders, and up to 18 months ago were to be generally referred to as such, which are now classified as cruisers in the United Kingdom publication entitled Fleets. The right honourable gentleman is aware we believe we have a clear case for increasing destroyer tonnage allocated to us under the London Naval Treaty, and we are already in negotiations on the subject with the foreign governments concerned. The Right Honourable General also observed that I was careful not to state on the 11th of March of last year that we considered we had the right to increase in cruiser to increase in cruiser's tonnage. Subject to this supplementary explanation, my statement on the 11th of March 1935 holds good. Then there's Mr. Alexander. Have not the Right Honourable General's government already announced that they have a programme of 70 cruisers in substitution for 50, including 10 overage cruisers? Why do they intend to scrap existing cruisers and waste money instead of keeping them? The Prime Minister, that matter can be, and of course will be, debated on the report stage of the Navy vote. That's a nice way of putting it to one side. Then Mr Churchill's back up again. Ah, we do love this. Ask the Minister for Ch the, con uh, the Coordination of Defence, what is the authority of, tribun of uh, tri authoritative tribunal for settling whether the legal construction of the 1931 London Naval Treaty makes it necessary for Great Britain to destroy five serviceable cruisers before the end of the present calendar year. The Minister for the Coordination of Defence, Sir Thomas Inskin, there is no tribunal for deciding whether a party to Part 3 of the London Naval Treaty is entitled to have recourse to Article 21 for the purpose of increasing its tonnage beyond the limits as fixed by the treaty. This is left to the judgment and good faith of the government's concerned. Now, I'm thinking he's talking about some C-class cruisers here, and I would use the phrase serviceable within in speech marks. Maybe if they were modified to the AA form and you did that, but they would still be very useful. Mr. Churchill, who then advises the government to as to exactly within what limits their good faith lies in proper interpretation of the treaty? Sir Tom Sinskip. Now, Tom Sinskip, remember, is the guy who makes the Inskip Award which returns the fleet air arm to the Royal Navy, so we should like him a little bit. On purely legal questions, the government has the advantage of the advice of the law officers of the Crown. Mr Churchill, is not this a question par excellence where the right honourable general would be able to give advice? If my advice is worth anything, it's always at the disposal of the government. Now, basically, Churchill was not a fan of the Minister for Coordination of Defence. He felt it was, as it was set up, a role without a role. It sounds good. I am the Minister for Coordination of Defence. What do you do? Well, there is a Navy Minister, who's the First Lord of the Admiralty. There's a the Army Minister. There's an Air Minister, who's the head of the Air Ministry. Um, my job is to be a minister who sits in cabinet and coordinates three other ministers. Really? You don't say. It's necessary, but if you don't have a combined chief of staff, and you can argue actually in the 1930s Britain did need to start developing a staff program. It's one of those things. Strategically, you do need a chief of defence staff in the 1930s. You need to start having that. You need to start having defence coordination introduced properly. And I'm not talking about a minister, I'm talking about a proper security system and a proper staff structure and a proper combined staff. If you're going to start securing the Far East, if you're going to secure Britain, all these things, you need that combined approach. It's not being pushed through Dota by all the politicians. And the services don't really want it. Why? Because the whole system structures it against, structures it against them wanting it because the whole system is about them fighting and making their own cases for their money in the parliament. 
and in the government. There is no system whereby they are forced to work together for it. One can argue the modern integrated review, the defense review is an attempt to do this, but um, by having the services produce their own cases, their own projections, then bring them in and, in, and individually present them, you actually set them up against each other again. Whereas it's almost a case of you almost need them, you do need the individual services because you need the individual identities in for some things. It does work well. After all, I'm, I'm sorry, but someone who spent their life being an infantry officer is not going to be able to command the ship, etc. You don't, they don't have the same transferable skills. Um, so, you know, combined armed forces can be a bit weird. But, what you can do, what you could do, is have a system whereby the armed forces get together, they thrash out their proposals together, and then they have to present those proposals as a joint group to Parliament or to the SESR or whatever program a reviewing system is going to. So instead of being presented as this service is presenting these, the, these capabilities, this service, these capabilities, all the services have to combine together to present what they need. Kind of interesting that they did. Anyway, let's last consideration is what do we end up with? We end up with the crown colonies, which I divided into the Fijis and the Salons. First point here, the stats, Southamptons, 9,100 tons. Gloucesters, 9,400 tons. Edinburgh's, 10,550 tons. Fiji's, roughly 8,000 tons. Salons, roughly 8,000 tons. Southampton's, 11,350 tons in full. Gloucester's, 11,650 tons in full. Edinburgh's, 13,175 tons in full. Fiji's, 10,725 tons in full. Salon's, 10,840 tons full. Okay, so at this point, we reckon Fiji and Salon must be taking on a lot of fuel and a lot of water. Because they're supposed to be roughly 8,000 tons, and yet, if we compare it to the Southamptons, they put on mm, 2,250 tons. The Gloucesters put on 2,250 tons to get to full. The Edinburghs put on 2,000. 625 tons to get to full, but they had much bigger ships. And then the Fiji's put on 2,725 tons, but they're a smaller ship, and the Ceylon's 2,840 tons, and they're a smaller ship again. Okay. Length, 591 feet 6 inches for Southamptons. Gloucesters, the same. Edinburgh's, 613 feet 6 inches. Fiji's and Salons, 555 feet 6 inches. So, well, you've heard it here first, they are 36 feet shorter. Yeah. 36 feet. That's a long way. Um, beam, 61 foot 8 inches, Southampton's 62 foot 4 inches, Gloucester's, Edinburgh's 63 feet 4 inches, and Gloucester's and Salons, 62 feet, so bang in the middle of Southampton and Gloucester's. Draft for the Sevigian Salons, uh, 16 foot 6 inches, hmm, that's interesting, considering for the Southampton's it's 20 foot 4 inches, Gloucester's 20 foot 7 inches, Edinburgh's 21 feet. Again, so that would suggest um, a hull which has 
a lot less volume internally. Where does all that fuel and water go? Again, it's the 4 Admiralty free drum boiler approach, driving Parsons uh, geared turbines and we're developing 72,500 uh, shaft horsepower over four shafts for a top speed of 31.5 knots and a range of 10,100 nautical miles at 12 knots. We do know, of course, one manages a 30 knot plus run across the Atlantic, though. So that's a fairly decent speed. Of the Fiji's, um, let's consider that again compared to the others. Eight thousand nautical miles at fourteen knots for the Enneburys, based on two thousand two hundred sixty tons of oil. Okay. Um, Range of seven uh, for Gloucesters, there's 780 50, 50 nautical miles at 13 knots, based on 2,100 tons of oil in HMS Manchester, and uh, 7,700 7, miles at 13 knots, based on 2,060 tons of oil in the Southamptons. So, ten thousand one hundred nautical miles at twelve knots. Well, you're going to have a bit more revs. But I'm not quite sure you're going to need that much oil to get... Well, it's at 12 knots as well, so it's at the slowest speed for the cruising range. But it is, long, it is the longest range given. So, yes, a bit more oil. That much more oil? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. And that's 72,500 shaft horsepower engines, and then top speed of 31 and a half knots, which is theoretically the slowest top speed of any of these classes. Because on 80,000 shaft horsepower, Salons are getting to 32 knots, but still maintain the same range. But if we consider that they've gained 7,500 shaft horsepower, which is the difference between a Southampton and a Gloucester. And a Gloucester's top speed is listed as 32.3 knots, which again, I'm not quite sure I agree with. Uh, and the Southampton's top speed is 32 knots. Otherwise the same ship, but which has got an extra 7,500 shaft horsepower. VGs have 12 six inch guns, uh, Ceylon's nine, both in treble mounts. Both carry eight quick firing four, inches, uh, four inch guns in twin mounts. Uh, the Fijis carry eight pom poms in two Mark VII quad mountings, the Ceylon's 12 in three Mark VII quad mountings. They both have two treble 21 inch torpedo tubes for Mark 9 torpedoes. Uh, both carry two submarine walruses, they're fitted in Fiji and Kenya, mostly moved by 1944 from the remainder of class. And um, as you can see, their peacetime complement is roughly 730. Their wartime complement would well be, be bigger, uh, could be up to about 1,000. So, they're an interesting class, they have some interesting stats, and that is part one. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, what have we got this week coming up? Well, we've got the Lend-Lease Act on, Mar on the 11th of March. That's Thursday. 18, and uh, we've got the 14th of March, we've got Brew Ships 41. History of Armour and Phoebe's Warfare. Hopefully I'll be able to do that just this. I've got some books on order which should have arrived by then. 
and lie uh, well this week of course the crown, uh, the crown colony class um but next week it's going to be len least act and then after that it's going to be the minotaur class cruisers and then a tiger class and tiger class cruisers it's cool anyway thank you very much for watching i hope you've enjoyed if you do like please like please possibly consider pressing the subscribe button or even the little bell which gives you an alert of when i do more videos and thank you for everyone who has joined Patreon or Discord. Both groups are, to my mind, equally loved in many ways. Discord has always got a great conversation, and Patreon are very generous people who are managing to allow me to keep my book habit going, when, honestly, for some reason, I can't think why, uh, there isn't as much running around the country teaching going on anyway take care thank you for watching and hope you enjoy the next parts